the President of the United States. Thank you very much. Please. I'm not only late, but we're, <laughs> we're going to have problems. Uh, I know that I'm going to have a chance to say hello to you individually at the, uh, when we get out of here and, uh, and uh, go out the door and have some pictures taken. I see so many familiar faces out here, and I'd, uh, I just want to in mass say thank you to you for what you're doing. Jack Hume had an idea, and uh, now Lou Lerman is a part of that idea, and now you're all part of the idea, and it's one that is very much needed. We've, there's no question but that we have great difficulty getting our story of things that we're doing uh, widespread and out to the people. I have come to view myself when I'm making speeches, and they're covered by the national uh, TV press, for example, I see myself standing up there. I hear myself say about four words that are innocuous and contain no message at all. And then while I'm still silently speaking, I hear the commentator's voice over telling the people what he thinks I said. <laughs> and uh, we've got a message, and I'm, I'm just going to take a little while, so or a few minutes here. We have a lot of things in which there are there's just total misperception on the part of the people of what it is that we're doing. And we're having great difficulty as they hear the drum beat the other way, getting it out. One, uh, one that I could name is the, is the matter of civil rights. And uh, we're supposed to have a terrible negative record in that field. Well, if you look at what we've actually done, and before that, what it did in California, and the administration there, you find out that uh, uh, not very many, if any, uh, administrations prior to this one have done as much or accomplished as much as we have done. And uh, you women, and I'm glad to see you here, the same thing holds true with regard to what we're doing in that area. And again, we have a story to tell, and it is completely opposite of the misperception that exists. And not only is it a matter of the appointments that we've made and all, the fact that we have gotten, uh, as Faith is in charge of this, of, of an operation where in every one of the 50 states we persuaded the governors to appoint someone to do what we did in California, and that is to comb through the, the statutes and the regulations and find out where there are evidences of discrimination in those and then get them changed. We had 14 laws changed in California. Well, we're now doing this at the national level, and we have a big stack of computer readouts that have come back to us from the Justice Department. The only assignment we gave them was comb the laws, comb the regulations, and find any evidences in any of them where there is discrimination on the basis of sex. And now we are going to, we are now studying to find where can we solve those by administrative efforts or where will it require legislation by the Congress. And we will present the legislation as we find out all of these areas to correct it. The same is true of the economy. I heard a Democratic congressman in the air the other night, and he stood there and said that Paul Volcker had reduced inflation and I had raised the deficit. <laughs> no, he, I've told some and maybe some of you already that I, at la I know and I'm confident that our economic program is working because the Democrats aren't calling it Reaganomics anymore. <laughs> uh, but the Incidentally, if someone hasn't told you, for the last 12 months, the inflation rate has been running at 2.6 percent, and down from the double digits. Uh, but what we need, and we need it in a bipartisan way, we need people like yourselves. Jack's idea was in every congressional district, uh, people who uh, can be involved in speaking. Uh, that are in demand to service clubs, people who can get attention and so forth, who can call attention to what we are actually achieving and what we've done so far and what we are doing here in this administration. 
Now, I'm not going to go on talking about that anymore solo because, uh, as I have often said, you must have sometimes put the paper down and said, I, if I had a chance, I'd ask him and go ahead. <laughs> Let's have a, some question and answer. If you've got some questions, fire away. And I'll have to watch the clock so that we allow enough time for the picture taking at the door. President, uh, with inflation rate at 2.6 percent, that's an admirable record. And interest rates elevating in today's market. The true rate of interest is the highest it's ever been in this country. Yeah. It's probably now 9, 10 percent. You hear people like Alan Greenspan say, nobody in the, in, in, in the government, Congress, or administration will tackle this problem until after the 1984 election. You're absolutely right in what you're trying to accomplish. And the Congress will not take any steps, make any moves to resolve this issue. It would seem to me that if you took this to the American public, as you have done before, and say, we've got this deficit, we've got to get rid of it, the only way we can do it is to, is to cut these social welfare programs. Yeah. I believe that you'd get the support. Well, this, let me just tell you, and what we've done with all of our economic program, we never have gotten all that we asked for. Uh, if we had, the deficit right now would be $40 billion less uh, than it is. That's how much of the spending cuts we asked we didn't get. Now, we, we're going to continue on that line, and now it is left to me, I think, with a veto pen, and you might be interested to know that from the House of Representatives, I have a letter on my desk signed by 146 Democrat and Republican representatives. And in the letter are listed 11 spending areas in which they have pledged to me that if the appropriation bills come down with sizable increases over and above what we asked for for the 84 budget in those 11 areas, and I veto, they will uphold, sustain my veto. And the 146 is the number required to do that. So, uh, now, the but you're right, again, people don't understand what has been going on, and this is more of where we need the, the straight uh, talk. I don't happen to be in complete agreement with Alan on, on uh, some of the remarks he's made. There's a little volatility in the interest rates now that's made him fluctuate. I expect, and I know Don Regan does, that in the next uh, few months, they're going to begin to come down. I think what is keeping them up there is perception. Out there in the money market, they have seen that great surge of money and, uh, and then the string pulled back in 1980, and they've, they are not quite convinced yet that we're not going to go back to the recovery based on inflation, which has been the pattern in seven previous recessions since World War II. So it is a perception they have of kind of protecting themselves uh, until they know that for sure inflation is down because now the interest rate has no justification on the basis of inflation to be where it is. And I think that maybe a few of those vetoes uh, might be the convincer <laughs> that will help uh, begin to bring those down. Uh, say on a scale of one to ten, where is the likelihood of your candidacy? Where is the likelihood of your candidacy on a scale of one to ten? <laughs> 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 this is one that, that uh, this is a question I can't answer or speculate on. And let me just tell you why. Uh, if you look at it, there is no way to win. If I, if I should say no too early, I'm a dead duck and lame duck and, and dead duck and can't get anything done. But if I should say yes, immediately everything becomes a part of a political campaign in the eyes of our opponents and all. And again, you can't get anything done. I was just thinking, I went down to Atlanta the other day to address the uh, National Bar, the American Bar Association. Well, everyone assumes that's a logical thing for a president to do. But if I had indicated that I might be a candidate, then the whole furor would be, well, shouldn't, the, uh, shouldn't someone else other than the uh, taxpayers pay for that trip? Was that a presidential task or was that a candidate's task? So I'm going to wait till the last possible minute before <laughs> I say anything, one way or the other. Yes, Mark. Uh, do you think that we can see a, a flat tax in, in, in your agenda? 
could we see a flat tax in the agenda? Let me just, let me answer that in a general sense and say I wouldn't rule that out or anything else out. I am convinced, and we all are here, but we also know that 1984 is not a year <laughs> that the legislature is going to look kindly on this. I think all of us are agreed. We've got to simplify the income tax. It's, it's gotten to the point there's something immoral about telling people uh, that they can be fined and they can, be, they can go to jail and so forth for not making out their tax correctly, but the government says that even it doesn't understand the rules well enough to advise them on how to make it out. It's the only thing in your life and mine in which it is left to you to tell somebody how much you owe them. And they can punish you if you don't guess right. So I think... Uh, I, uh, uh, Mr. President, do you see us coming to fix exchange rates anytime in the near future and or a gold standard? We've had a commission studying on the, on the gold idea. Uh, their findings weren't very favorable to that. I know what you mean, and I know my myself. I've lived long enough to remember when it was all just kind of guaranteed and laid out there for you. It was X amount of gold or X amount of silver that you could get for that piece of paper. And I have wondered myself, history shows that uh, very few civilizations have ever been able to survive fiat money. But um, I can't give you an answer on that. On the fixed exchange rate, uh, I know that uh, President Mitterrand, uh, he wanted us to have another Bretton Woods conference. Uh, none of us at the, at the Williamsburg summit uh, believed that that was the answer. But we have agreed that we are going to, at the ministerial level, proceed with a joint study of what is the best way uh, to meet this problem. Now, I know that our allies and friends look at us because of the value of our dollar, and yet I remember a few years ago in the previous administration when our dollar wasn't worth anything and compared to the other currencies, and everyone was saying we must get the dollar back uh, where it is. But on the other hand, when we get the dollar back where it is, it hurts us with regard to the export market because we make everything of ours too high priced. But all I can tell you is we are seriously uh, riding herd on this subject and studying this because uh, we can't have these wide fluctuations that we have and, and maintain prosperity for all of us. Mr. President, uh, are you able to forecast uh, what you see as the relationship of the United States to Cuba? The relationship of the United States to Cuba. I don't know whether Castro would ever agree to my idea or not. <laughs> <laughs> but I believe this. I know that they're in dire straits. I know that they, uh, well, they're literally panhandling on the Soviet Union, and it's not in too good a shape itself economically. But, and they are totally at the command of the Soviet Union. We tried to open negotiations very early in my administration, or not negotiations, tried to open communications uh, with him and got no place. But I don't mean that, that doesn't mean we've forgotten this entirely. About if we could make him see how much better life could be for all of the people in Cuba, if he would sever his relations with the East and rejoin the family of American nations and once again become a Western Hemisphere nation like the rest. And we're prepared to sit down with him at any time and point out uh, these things. We've been a little encouraged by uh, what just sailing a few ships south uh, did with his public utterances. Uh, but um, this is, is my goal and ambition, and I know I'll be talking to Della Madrid about this uh, in the next several days when I meet with him. And I've talked to others in the Organization of American States. And I don't think, I don't think that it is impossible uh, to bring this about, because I think there's a limit to the Soviet Union's patience and I think there's a limit also to uh, the Cubans living. You know, when Cuba, uh, whose greatest asset was sugar, in this last year has had to import sugar, where it can't even provide for itself in the one thing that used to be its great export crop, uh, they have to be taking some second looks at, at what's going on there. Can we ask for one more question? Oh. 
take two more because I pointed at him already. Mr. President, if we fail to stop the Sandinistas and the Cubans in Central America, what do you feel will be the Soviets' next move in this hemisphere? I believe that we have to believe what the Sandinista leaders themselves have said. First of all, their pledge in that revolution that this would be a democracy with all that goes with a democracy if they ousted the Somoza government was made in writing to the Organization of American States in return for which the OAS persuaded Somoza to step down and let them take over. They have not kept that arrangement at all. They are a totalitarian government, as we know, and the, I am convinced that, that we must continue the help that we're giving because their leaders have openly stated to our visiting congressmen who've gone down there, many of whom have gone down not agreeing with our policies, but they have heard and come back here and come to me personally to tell me that they've changed their position because they've heard these leaders of the Sandinista government tell them that this isn't a revolution in one country that this is a revolution for all of Central America. And would you believe it if I tell you that one of them, and not a bottom of the line functionary, one of them said to them, don't be surprised if within the next 18 months you see us at the Arizona-Mexican border. Now, if they're willing and arrogant enough to make statements of that kind, I'm gonna be arrogant enough to say, we're not gonna sit here and let the Soviet Union and Cuba create any more communist countries in the Americas. answered my question just now, but as representatives of Citizens for America, if we were to return to our local news medias, what would be the one point you would like us to reiterate again and again with respect to Central America? Um, first of all, and the very reason for the appointment of the commission that we've just appointed, is that after decades, well, a century or more, our government, we're the big colossus of the North. And I know that previous presidents have gone and said, well, here's a good neighbor policy, or here's another policy. And we've been very insensitive about our neighbors to the South. With our background of gunboat diplomacy down there in a certain period of our history, it's been the United States, the big colossus, coming in and saying here to all of you, here is a plan. But, you know, it's a, take it. It's, sort of like Lyndon Johnson when he used to say, come, let us reason together. It's a passage from the Bible, and he never added the second sentence in the verse, which was, and if thou refuse, thou shalt be destroyed by the sword. <laughs> <laughs> so when, when, I made, when I made my trip down there, to every leader down there from Brazil where we started on and into Central America, I told him one thing. I pointed out to them, I said, look, we're unique in all the world, this hemisphere. I said, we have this common heritage, European heritage in which we came here into these wilderness continents and as pioneers and developed them. And I said also, from pole to pole, from south of, southern, the, the Antarctic to the, to the Arctic, these two, we, we worship the same God. And, and this was the one I was surprised to realize there must be a resentment that we call ourselves Americans, understandably. We don't go around saying, I'm a United States. But they have thought, evidently, that we kind of had seized that for ourselves. And you should have seen the reaction when I said to them, look, again, the unique thing. When we cross the borders in North or South or Central America into another country, we're still among Americans. We're all Americans here. And the reaction was so amazing. So I said to them, look, I don't come here with any plan. I said, what I'm coming here is to find out from you. What are your thoughts and ideas, and how can we, as American countries, here in this hemisphere, as equal partners, how can we come together so as to speed economic development, to develop the resources that still are here in these, in these great continents, and be united in our determination to preserve a democratic, free way of life? And uh, the, re the response was, was very heartening. And this is what I think 
that we should be telling, we're not down there to make a war. Here is a country that has turned democratic, that has held its election, that got more than 80% of its people to vote, and they voted under the threat from the guerrillas of vote today and die tonight. But they walked for miles. The buses and the trucks had been destroyed and bombed and burned to keep them from getting to the polls. We've had eyewitnesses from our country, our Congress, who saw a woman standing in the lines waiting hours to vote had been shot by the guerrillas and would not leave the line to get medical treatment until she had voted. So our message is we want not to be the big boss of the North. We want to bring all of these countries into a kind of partnership where retaining our own sovereignty and our own culture and all, we can be allies in the sense that here, from pole to pole, we want democracy, we want individual freedom, and the human rights that we have come to expect in our own, in our own country. And the only reason that we're trying to help militarily down there is this country, El Salvador, which is now trying to become a democracy, which has redistributed land, but the farmers they've given the land to can't go out and farm it because it's a battleground. They'll get shot if they go out there. They can, the people that have to be cared for by the government because their jobs are gone, because of power plants that have been destroyed, industries, the infrastructure that has been wiped out by the guerrillas. So all we're saying is we want to help them provide a shield while they go forward with these economic and social reforms that they're not getting their heads shot off while they're doing it. And if they understand that, that this isn't us, we're not going into another Vietnam, let me tell you one thing. There isn't a country in Latin America that would hold still or ask for our, our actual military forces. They very frankly tell us they must have our help. They need our training. They need our weapons and all of that. But they proudly say, our men, we can do the job ourselves. We need your help in providing the tools. And if, if the people of America will only understand it, if they'll also only understand that the uh, we, we hear so much, there's such a bias in the news that we hear every little violation of a human right that occurs on the part of the government in El Salvador. We see our TV crews go up into the jungles and settle down with the, uh, with the guerrillas and portray them as uh, nice, uh, innocent people living out there uh, under the sky and they just want uh, their human rights and so forth. But we don't hear anything of or very much about uh, the recent episode where they captured uh, 45 El Salvadoran soldiers and they executed 34 of them. And the bodies have all been returned with the single bullet in the head. Uh, and if Americans understand that it's that type of thing we're trying to stop and that what is going on down there is by way of Cuba, Soviet-inspired, there is no question about it. It is, they have boasted, when they inaugurated the government of Nicaragua, the Sandinista government, they boasted that this was uh, not only the beginning of a revolution here, but this was, that Nicaragua now was the first foothold of communism on the mainland of the Americas. And the, one other thing, and I've talked too long here. Oh boy, I say I have. I'm doing the dining room right now with another group. <laughs> uh, let me um, let me just uh, say here that the that the other thing that I think the people need to know uh, is that the guerrillas in Nicaragua, whom we are trying to help, no question about it, are actually were part of the revolution. They were part of the Sandinista revolution, but that element that was communist ousted them. Some were exiled, some were imprisoned. Uh, many of them, they were just thrown out of the government. And these guerrillas are not, they're fighting only to restore what they thought they were fighting a revolution for. And we're helping them. Now listen, God bless you for what you're going to do and <laughs> spread the word. I'm supposed to right here. Right here? Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, I understand from the photographer standpoint, it's better to have the president on the stage. Yeah. And if you will come on to the stage this way, come across, shake hands with the president, and then move.